So ladies and gentlemen, Dean Kamen, the, obviously the inventor of the Segway and uh, one of the deep thinkers we have. Well, let's see. Especially after uh, Paris, I am not sure uh, what we're here to do or exactly what level to, uh, to deal with the issues. To step back to what I think everybody here is talking about, transportation, but it's, it's so broadly defined, I'd like to recap the history of what I see as the issues of transportation, particularly related to dense areas and cities, because I think that's what we were addressing with this. And since I only have a few minutes, we're going to have to race through all the inventions that really caused the problems. And the car is not necessarily the first big one. So here's a very compressed piece of human history. Uh, the Earth was formed. It did OK. It got really cold. The dinosaurs all died. Um, people started walking, which was unique and unusual. We stand up. Um, the first really big invention that started this problem, I think, is the plow. People argue, but it's somewhere between 8,500 and 10,000 years ago. The plow allowed people to start going from hunter-gatherers to organized societies. From the day they did that, it is indisputable that the most powerful anthropogenic uh, uh, force among humanity is that we live in communities. Once we started living in communities, we developed language, which gave us history, which gave us the capability to learn from our own mistakes, or at least to improve on doing them more effectively in each new generation. Uh, in any event, we started building towns and cities. As soon as we started doing that, we started having congestion problems. It's always been interesting to me that ancient Greece, well over 3,000 years ago, uh, in fact, Mesopotamia, it is well known that the ancient cities had rules, laws, like you can't bring your cart and ox inside the city walls from one hour before sunrise till one hour after sunset. You don't have to be a genius to figure out. They were already concerned about traffic jams when you put big animals and machines among people that had architected a pedestrian environment. There were only one and a half million people on the planet at the time, and they had problems because they were mixing modes in highly dense pedestrian urban environments. It didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. Let's skip, because we're running out of time, the next 9,900 years or so. And uh, you get to 101 years ago, 1903. Here's just some data for you. Can't argue with it, because it's data. We can argue about what it means. Interestingly, in that same year, in terms of transportation, Henry Ford built his first car, and the Wright brothers flew the first airplane. Here's the situation. This is just a situation analysis. In that year, 9% of the global population lived in cities. 91% of the world didn't live in cities. Most of them were farmers, even in the United States. The world was good for the people that lived in the cities. A, the cities were small. They weren't congested by cars. People generally walked around. That's what sort of defined a city. That's for 2,000 years what defined a city, a place where people could go from place to place where they work and where they think and where there's art and where there's food on their feet. And those 9% of the people did that. The rest of the people, of course, had problems because they had to go through great distances and carry all of their hay or their strawberries or their nails. And so horses and carts that had been used for thousands of years were still being used, carrying heavy stuff, going great distances. Henry Ford figures he can solve that problem. It's pretty clear from everything he wrote he never anticipated that cars would be filling up cities. The Wright brothers also never assumed that people would fly from one block to the next. 
he got it right, so did we. We built airports for his invention. We started out 40 years later building highways for the other invention, but then things went awry. Anyway, skip ahead a little bit, and here's some interesting new data for you. By the way, Henry Ford, when he started building these things, he did build the product that changed the world in a very positive way. And oh, by the way, not to be the pure contrarian here, and of course I'm taking a, a, a extreme perspective here, and I'm aware that I'm doing that. It sometimes helps people think. But I'll take the perspective that the reason that we're having trouble solving the problem is we're defining it incorrectly. I mean, it's like rum and coke makes you drunk. Whiskey and coke make you drunk. The common element is coke. We've got to figure out why coke makes people drunk. We laugh at that. I've seen an awful lot of people that are sick and tired of reading about the link between cancer and smoking. We're just going to have to give up reading. So here we all sit saying we've got to fix the transportation problem and it's cars, it's oil, it's pollution. I'll take the position for you that cars in a hundred years, it's the largest industry on the planet, supplies a lot of great uh, jobs. And I'd argue that, by the way, last year 14 million people in the United States tripped or fell down and hurt themselves badly enough from a standing position that they needed to go to the hospital for care. A modern car can drive into a tree at 30 miles an hour and it's rare that somebody gets hurt. These are magnificent pieces of technology that scream along highways at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour carrying you and your whole family from one city to another, making commerce possible, making us have a high standard of living, bringing goods all over the place. What's wrong with these machines? They keep you warm all winter and cool all summer. They can take you anywhere you want to go. They carry all our goods. And at constant speed, when they're not accelerating and decelerating, they're remarkably efficient. You get their catalytic converters hot, they're remarkably clean. They were designed to run at these nice speeds, and they do it extremely well. They cost less per pound than a hamburger. They typically run reliably these days for five or ten years. If I picked up this computer and tapped it as I put it down over there, we'd all be relieved if it still worked. Your car is this indestructible pile of technology. I could argue, yeah, it's true, they've had a hundred years, they've had a lot of R&D. But the reason people are frustrated that there isn't a lot of improvement in cars isn't because they're so crummy, it's because they're starting to reach some of the limits of their capability. What we're complaining about is fundamentally an entire misuse of that technology. I mean, I flew out here in a plane, and I'm not embarrassed to say, I fly a plane. It takes a lot of fuel too, but I get that thing up to 41,000 feet. I'm cruising along at eight-tenths the speed of sound. I'm proud of what humans have done with technology. And I don't think anybody in this room would think, it's time to go to Boeing. I know that they can build a device that can take me and my whole neighborhood from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States in five hours, and yeah, it's okay, and they're incredibly safe, that's okay. But it's time to go complain to them because once it lands, that last five miles, when I taxi home, those wings start cutting down trees, and, and my neighbors complain about those jet engines. We all have figured out, you optimize the airplane, you really want to go 600 miles an hour, you can do it. You leave the thing at the airport. You build an infrastructure that makes it do what it's supposed to do, and you don't do something else with it, and if you do do something else with it, you can't go back and complain that Boeing failed because the thing isn't as quiet as a bicycle. Yet, we all have managed to decide that cars belong everywhere. Yes, I did just say I love them, but I don't keep one in my living room, and I don't think they belong in the middle of cities. So let's jump from 1903 to 2003. What happened to the world? We went from a billion people on the planet to six billion. That's bad enough. Here's the real catch. In the entire course of human history, for the first time in human history, more than 50% of the people that are now alive live in cities or megacities. So Henry Ford's great course of human history for the first time in human history, more than 50% of the people that are now alive live in cities or megacities. 
So Henry Ford's great solution to get across the farm or from the farm to the town or from the town to the railway station, this great solution for the 91% of the people that was going to do a great thing worked. And the people in the cities in 1903, they were building subways and trolleys and if they had to go further than they could walk, they built great machines that could carry huge numbers of people on their trolleys and their subways, distances that they needed to run around towns, and that worked. People were not stupid then. But suddenly, after World War II, the automotive and the oil industries are huge. They saw that everybody's moving to cities. And by the way, it's 50% now. So it was 9% of 1 billion. It's now 50% of 6 billion live in cities. And a city needs a car like a fish needs a bicycle. But anyway, we get to 2003, and we have this dilemma that we all claim is, is a problem. And we're going to fix it by go beating up the car companies, which to me is like beating up Boeing, because I can't taxi home. You can't fix that problem that way. Let's define the problem properly. So let's project forward, according to every credible international organization that studies population, demographics. They're telling us, yeah, we know cities are big. We know they're crowded. We know they got slums. We know we have all these problems all over the world. Here's the data. In the next 20 years, all human population growth on this planet will be in cities. All of it. Asia alone expects to move 800 million people into cities in the next 20 years. 800 million people, 20 years. Let's say each city had 10 million people. That's Manhattan. That's 80 cities. I'll do some quick math for you. 80 cities in 20 years, that's one new city, the size and density of Manhattan, every six weeks for 20 years. That's just Asia. Now, you can tell me all you want about how we're going to tweak the cafe standards. We'll make cars 2% more efficient. You can swat up the flies while you're getting trampled by the elephants all you want. If 20 years from today, most of the global population will be living in cities, why don't we address what the real problem is? Let's come up with a neat, convenient, effective way for people to get around in cities. And let's recognize that cars and trucks that have made our standard of life uh, something we take for granted, that use a highway system that's low density, that connects all these cities, the highway systems of the world are literally the eighth wonder of the world. Most of them are big and efficient. They work. Very few people get hurt out there. Most of the 40,000 people that get killed by cars in this country, and the million and a half that get put in hospitals every year, it happens at low speeds, looking to park your car or not running over the kid that ran out between two cars or not backing over a kid. Understand, when you build a highly dense pedestrian-based environment and you start running 20-foot-long steel boxes through it, that have been designed to go at 60 miles an hour, it's unlikely you're going to get an optimum solution. Nobody in this room, if they were given a major city and said, people used to walk around between all these buildings, and the first floor of all these buildings used to be nice shops, and restaurants, but now, since cars can't go up on the roof or into the penthouse, now the first floors of all these cities are these big, cold places where we stack these boxes. They take up most of the space that used to be there to make it a pedestrian-friendly, exciting, uncongested, clean, productive environment. What are we going to do? Any normal person would say, why don't we get these boxes just outside the city, let them do what they do really well. If I want to go from Manchester to Colorado, I've got a great idea. I'll get in my airplane. I'll spend an hour at 600 miles an hour going 600 miles. Then I'll land at an airport which, if you put a pin in the map, you're never more than 30 miles from anywhere you want to go. And then I'll get into a car that can go 60 miles an hour, down from my 600, but I only have to go for half an hour to the edge of this city. And then when I get to the edge of the city, I've got to go that next factor at 10. I'll go down from 600 to 60, from 60, how about down to 6, which is three times walking speed. Not very good, you might say. Here's another piece of data. In the same 100 years, all the technical marvels in 1903, nobody had ever flown. Within this hundred years, how have we done in technology? Well, let's see, we built airplanes. We built spaceships. We would put people on the moon. We just put little robots on Mars. How have we done for the people in the cities? Well, in ancient Greece, 
You walked from the theater of Dionysus to the Acropolis by slapping on those sandals, two miles an hour. But the city was small, and it worked. Today, you slap on those sneakers, two miles an hour. It's the only form of transportation to which technology hasn't only helped it in 2,000 years, it's hurt it because the cities have lost their density. People confuse density and congestion. They think we're trying to get rid of high density. A city can't work unless the density goes up. We've got to get the congestion down. The way you get the density up and the congestion down is get rid of all the junk that's separating the things that people used to be able to walk between. But we live in a world now where time is so critical to people, even if you could walk from place A to place B like the Greeks, our sense of time is different. I used to wait for the mail then a phone, email, wireless pager. We have this instant need. Nobody's going to walk a half an hour anymore. But here's the data. Yep, we did put that rover on Mars in the year 2003, whether you took London or Beijing or New York, the average speed from point A to point B, no matter how you choose to do it, is about eight miles an hour. The reason we're all frustrated when we get into a cab or any of these other ideas and go at eight miles an hour, nobody says, wow, that's four times as fast as walking. That's 400% of walking speed. The reason we're frustrated is because every device we've used has been optimized to do 60. And that's what it was doing until I got to the city. But that's a ridiculous assertion. If the city's going to be a place about which high density and human interaction work, you only have to compete with eight miles an hour. And then you get people out of the cars. All this other data will run out of oil, we can't breathe, we'll melt the caps. That won't do it. Somebody was quoting Stuart Brand as saying, his catalog, they were impressed that it says, we only buy, you should only buy what you need, not what you think you need. People don't buy what they need. They not, only, not even don't only buy what they think they need. What they really need or think they need, they expect is free. Like health care, education, air, water, that stuff that they need is free. People buy only one thing, what they want alcohol, cigarettes, lottery tickets, mindless nonsense, jet skis, snowmobiles. There's no shortage of us buying stuff. We'll buy it if we want it, not if we need it. If the cars slow down so much in that city that you really stop griping in the back of that cab because it's now not going only seven or eight, which has got your front, it's going two, you'll get out and walk because it's your fastest means and time is the most valuable thing we have. Well, what if you could take a pedestrian environment, which in the next 20 years will be 70% of all human beings? What if you could take that pedestrian environment, it's called a city, and give people an alternative that they could actually go eight miles an hour? I'm going eight miles an hour. Supposing you could give them that alternative of going eight miles an hour without having to change the infrastructure. I don't need runways. I don't need subway tunnels. I don't need hanging gantries. I'm the size and shape of a pedestrian. I stop and back up and move like a pedestrian. But I'm a legitimate option, an alternative, to a 3,000-pound machine that was designed for something else. And I left my airplane at the airport. I left my car in an intelligent place just outside the city, a mile away, not where it's the most expensive real estate on the planet. And what if even 10% of the people that live in those cities decided to take an intelligent option because it's fun, it's productive, it's efficient, etc.? Maybe if you offer people something that they want, they would do what's right. In the end, people almost always do what's right after they exhaust all the other alternatives. <laughs> Are we going to wait until that happens? And I guess I would say to you, I think a lot of people would take this alternative now if we let them. We're acting like it's all these technical problems that haven't been solved. The truth of the matter is technology is not what's inhibiting human progress. It's the inability of major organizations to accept and promote change. I mean, we have a highway department. That makes sense on the highways. We also have a navy. I don't think they do a lot of work in Arizona. Why is it the highway department that I have to go to in every city to find out if I can put these things in downtown? What the hell is a highway doing in Fifth Avenue? 